we're back. Hi again, everyone. And there's so much Bye. going on. Hi, Kevin. Hey. Uh, yeah, well, I, let's uh, continue in Vlad's tone from last time. I think uh, our next speaker here uh, requires uh, no or little introduction. I mean, if you don't know Kevin from his uh, talks or trainings, and probably you know him from his passion of collecting various error messages that can be found in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not joking, because uh, Kevin was uh, supposed to travel to Bucharest uh, this year, and then I kept uh, searching for, uh, to give him a present and find some uh, error message uh, from Romania that uh, he doesn't have. I'm still looking. Uh, don't get me wrong. There. We have plenty of time. I mean, the world is currently a big error message, so maybe that counts. <laughs> Yeah, I cannot compete with that, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Um, all right, so then um, Kevin's going to talk to us about uh, unreasonable architecture. So what is unreasonable architecture? Well, um, it's... We're, we're already writing the reasonable architecture. I don't know oh, about of you, of but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I thought, I thought a little bit of a play on words because we often use the word, um, the original meaning of the word um, reasonable is, is not, hey, it's okay. It's, it's, uh, it, it actually means something you can reason about. And many of our interests and many of our paradigms, in fact, all of our paradigms pretty much, um, and a lot of um, the movements that we see within software are to do with reason. They are to do with how do I as a human being, how can I create code that I as a human being can understand, that I can inhabit, you know, how do I create an environment that is uh, something I can work in? So we, we have all of these different approaches, how to organize our thoughts. That's what we're doing. When, when one person is saying, oh, we should use this pattern or another person is saying we should use this paradigm, they're just simply trying to organize their thoughts. When we talk about code that is unclear, we say that's a problem. So whether it's software craft or, or, or whatever, we are normally talking about how do we do this? So what about architectures that are unreasonable intrinsically? In other words, there are aspects of what we are building that it's not a, question of how good we can make it is actually we won't be able to reason about them and sometimes that's a property of the kind of the thing we're building sometimes it's a property of the world that, that our system is connected to um, and we are entering an age where this is becoming more and more important that uh, our and that this is i find this an interesting challenge because i spent my whole career saying hey we need to create code so that we can understand it this is cohesive i can put it in my head i can work with it and now the basis of a lot of our systems is like that you know yeah especially for instance if i'm thinking now on i don't know uh, ai uh yeah product, AI, learning. ai how we interact with the market even where we think we have a reasoned piece of code the point is that that code connects to the world and the world is not reasonable um, so in other words, we close ourselves off by classic computer science kind of views like I'm going to just close this in. Uh, that doesn't mean to say all of these other practices are not useful, but we need to understand kind of where they're useful. And I think that's the big challenge for us in the next few years. And I think this is funny because we spent uh, yeah, career, entire careers, I don't know, making code clear, like you said, and then exactly. removing all uncertainty from the code. Yeah. But now with newer systems, you need to embrace it somehow. And, uh, exactly, and that's hard. the problem. I think some people are struggling, and I might count myself amongst them, but we are hitting the limits of what we can possibly know and what is reasonable for us uh, to expect from ourselves. Um, and I think that that's, that's the, the problem. And sometimes I see this with developers that they say, oh, well, yeah, it should be like this. And it's just like, well, no, but it isn't. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do that's going to change that. Um, uh, it's intrinsic to the way that we have built the system uh, or the fact that we've connected the system to the world. I think that's increasingly going to become our challenge, which doesn't mean everything needs to be disordered, um, uh, 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 but it just means that we have to apply a different thinking model to how we go about building things. Right. Well, sounds really interesting. So uh, I'm going to definitely uh, pay attention. So you okay. have the floor. I, right, excellent. I will share my screen. And so let's just check that everybody can see that. And um, let me move a few things around here. I'm going to take this off because I don't need it. Um, any other communication will come through the chat. 
So, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, honestly, I hope your weather is better than mine. Um, it's uh, afternoon, it's the UK, it's raining, which kind of sounds normal for the UK, but we've actually had a really good summer, so this is very disappointing. <clears throat> I would consider this weather to be unreasonable from a personal perspective. But what I'm going to explore now is this idea of um, unreasonable architecture. Um, and to follow on from what we were saying in the chat before the talk, um, I it kind of very much made a career out of trying to reason about things, you know, um, uh, pattern oriented software architecture. What we're trying to do is learn how to reason about our designs to be able to say this design resolves these forces. This design solves this problem. This design has these trade offs. Um, this design has this rationale. We are doing this like this because of, and we talk about this in our coding practices. Um, I edited uh, 97 things every program should know about 10 years ago. It's, it stood the test of time very well. And a lot of what it talks about is reasonable. Um, most recently this year with Trisha G edited 97 things every Java programmer should know. And again, it's based on uh, the idea of no ability that we can know what it is that we are building uh, and the way that it can behave and should behave and all the rest of it. And I'm going to have to scope this talk because clearly when it comes to unreasonable, I could be talking about the side effects of things like technical debt. I will mention that a little later, but a lot of it is not to do with the chaos of our own making. It's the idea that intrinsic to many systems, we have a challenge because the way that we have learnt software development or encourage others to do so, we're not always necessarily good at it, but even in the kind of heartland of computer science, something like the structure and interpretation of computer programs um, in the seventies, we see this very simple <coughs> um, uh, appeal. Programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. In other words, they're for people, it's for reading. Um, William Zinser, who, is, um, who was an American uh, author, he um, wrote a very uh, lovely way of describing the kind of systems um, that we want to think about building and how we think about building them. Uh, it's a very simple idea. Four basic premises of writing. Um, clarity, brevity, simplicity, and humanity. And this is an interesting one because humanity in its broadest sense, um, when we use it in the way that he's using it, it means compassion. It means an, an understanding for someone else. When we write, we must write with an understanding for somebody else. That person is human. They are not a machine. We, we don't write code for machines to execute. Otherwise we'd all be sitting here with just a kind of assembler and that would be it. We choose our paradigms for other people. We, uh, the way that we write code, the discussions that we have about code, these are all about the human side. Um, they are, and we favor simplicity because that's appealing to us. It turns out it doesn't have any difference as far as the processor is concerned. It doesn't really care about the quality of your code, how well you partition uh, your domain across classes and functions and packages. It, it doesn't care about um, the consistency of your indentation, the accuracy of your naming, none of these things. You can have the most ridiculous control flow, doesn't care. Simplicity is a quality that we perceive. Um, so, you know, our tradition is built up around this. Um, Tony Hoare makes this observation. There are two ways of constructing a software design. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated. There are no obvious deficiencies. The first method is far more difficult. The, and this is really interesting because it also tells us why it is that this talk could have been completely different. I could have been just talking technical debt, the difficulty of um, working with practices um, in a socio-technical system. That's what software development is. It is both a social, human side and technical. Looking at it from that point of view, a business is not always the right, uh, business culture does not always bring out the best in us. So that is one talk, but that's not this talk. When we talk about that, we are trying to say, well, how do we get from the the, the mess or the issues, the, um, the, the trade-offs that we make poorly to a world that looks much more classic and coherent. So um, this is a book on my bookshelf, um, um, Structured Analysis and System Specification. It's a book from the 1970s. I kind of collect old books. I, I don't make a big thing of it, but I, I buy enough every now and then. I, I like to kind of like, these. we have these 
kind of landmark publications at various points that are appealing. They influence me at very different points, sometimes because I borrowed them early in my career. Um, but also they set up and help reinforce um, many of the concerns that we now have. Cohesion and coupling. These are things that we often talk about, but they feel like they have a very computer science-y kind of quality. That they, they are almost a mathematical type of thing. And that's not to say they can't be described like that. But why? Why? Why this rather than something else? So DeMarco says, he talks about cohesion. He says, cohesion is a measure of the strength of association of the elements inside a module. Some people are familiar with um, uh, single responsibility principle. Um, I would suggest not being distracted by that and focus on the original principles. Um, cohesion is much broader. Cohesion is with respect to a number of things. Uh, it can be with respect to rate of change. It can be with respect to usage. It can be with respect to implementation. In other words, it's the broad concept. Um, SRP is a very narrow and poorly misunderstood aspect of that. It is a kind of cohesion, um, but uh, it is only one. There are many. And this idea of understanding um, this binding, this coherence, this cohesiveness, the degree to which a thing, whether it be a block or a function uh, or a class or a package or a subsystem or whatever, it, it, it's, its structure, the desire that it wants to hold together, but it doesn't want to stay together. I'm, I'm projecting onto it because the point here is that what we're actually making an observation about is us. Any attempt to divide them up would only result in increased coupling. This is why having both the cohesion and the coupling um, as your concerns. One tra often trades off with the other. That's why they keep each other in check. Um, and it's a very useful way of thinking about um, your code. You make trade-offs between one and the other. And then the last bit, decreased readability. Readability. That's for us. That's, 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 we do this for us because we can hold it in our heads. We have created whole paradigms around this. Structured programming because we wanted structure rather than non-structure. Okay, that's the whole idea, a coherent view, how to organize blocks that ultimately gave rise to things like object-oriented programming. We see this kind of coherence, it's, it's useful for us. We have domain-driven design. Again, domain-driven design builds on this. It it's a desire to try and see structure in the world and then project that structure into our code so that we are able to reason about it between the two. That's a really important idea there because what we're saying is that it's not simply that we want modularity, we want modularity, we want a correspondence between our different our modules and the thing we are looking at in our domain. Our very the basis of our very practices, encapsulation. So this observation from Michael Feathers I think is really important. Many people misunderstand encapsulation. They think uh, encapsulation is uh, an object-oriented practice alone. Uh, it, it's much broader than that. They think it's it's simply putting private in front of a, um, a, a data field. And again, it's not really that. Um, you will you will be, you, you put private in front of your data fields because it supports encapsulation, but it is not equivalent to it. Encapsulation is quite literally putting a capsule around something, to put something in a capsule, to make a separation between something in the outside world. So there's an inside and outside, and there is a boundary. And to understand as a user of this abstraction, what the meaning of that boundary is, the semantics of that interface, whether we look at it from a testing point of view or a discussion point of view, that's the important thing. Encapsulation is important, but the reason why it is important is more important. Encapsulation helps us reason about our code. In well encapsulated code, there are fewer paths to follow as you try to understand it. So the point here is encapsulation isn't an end in itself. It is a tool for understanding. That's us. That's nothing to do with the code itself. That's, uh, that's for our benefit. This is what we want. And this is this idea to help us reason about our code. We want to be in control of our code. So it's control and determinism and confidence, the ability to reason, which is where that word reasonable comes from. So is our code reasonable? Well, most of the time, the things that we create, even when we're not doing our best job, even when the circumstances push us in a different direction, it's still relatively reasonable. And this is interesting because what I want to contrast this with is systems that are not reasonable. So this is taken from a paper published about nine or 10 years ago. Um, and uh, what was interesting here is that it, 
it, it looked at um, the call graph of the uh, Linux kernel. And uh, it, it looked at the relationships, um, basically separated out, if you like, um, kind of three layers. Um, the, the most fundamental primitives, the workhorse and the, um, and the uh, middle manager and the master regulator layers. You'll understand a bit more about these terms in a moment, where they're coming from, because they don't immediately strike you as being software engineering terms. But notice the structure. You've got this kind of fan out and fan in. We have a set of primitives at the bottom, which everybody depends on and are used. And then we, uh, and we expand out. And these, are, these different services or different aspects are used in many different ways at the top level, which is narrower potentially. That's designed. That's designed by humans. Let's look at something that is not designed. This is basically the uh, in structure, the regulatory network, uh, the genome, uh, as, as encoded by the genomes of the E. coli bacteria. Um, this is why the terms regulator are being used there, regulatory network. Notice this is quite different. This looks hugely different. Now, notice there's a number of different, uh, a number of key differences. First of all, there's the overall form. Um, it has a broad base. In fact, if you were to literally 3D print this, you can tell which one is the more stable because the Linux core graph is like, well, if, it all, if it's all working, uh, then it's all working. But if you just push it and there's the slightest error, the whole thing falls apart. This is one of the first things you learn about software is that it does not degrade gradually and gently in the way that the real world things do. Real world, the real world, that's the other thing I want to draw your attention to. Look at the density of connection. There is a high degree of redundancy. And there is this idea that when we look at our genomes, they are, they are not modular. You don't have your genetic code. Is, you don't have everything organized out. This just does one thing. That's the thing you read in the newspapers. It's kind of like convenient. You know, this causes this. This causes this. This leads to this trait. That is a convenient and mostly tidy fiction. It's not that tidy. Um, evolution gives us a, uh, an adaptive mess. We will find that there is no respect of single responsibility in the components. Everything has redundant responsibility. There is huge amounts of duplication. You knock out one part, the whole thing still keeps on going. This is an important difference. There is redundancy, duplication. There's a lack of coherent responsibility in any one of the single nodes. And yet it is insanely resilient. This is a very interesting contrast. This is not to say that our operating systems are not resilient, but they're not resilient like life is resilient. Um, uh, life is surprisingly resilient. If you think about what actually goes on um, uh, every day with your body, and here we are at the height of a pandemic, um, worrying about uh, that, when we actually look at it, it is astonishing that we are able to work at all um, and that our bodies continue to function in the world as it exists. Uh, so. It is this amazing resilience, and yet you would not have architected it like that at all. This is the difference between things that are created through conscious design effort versus things that are uh, subject to a different um, uh, set of forces uh, on their creation. And as Tom Clancy noticed, the difference between reality and fiction Fiction has to make sense. That's the whole point. It has to make sense. Therefore, we want to reason about it. If our story, if we, if you write a story or you watch a film that does not make sense, then people don't enjoy it. They, they criticize it because it doesn't make sense. But the real world is under no obligation to do that. If we write code that does not apparently make sense, does not have all of this coherence, these qualities of separateness and these qualities of reduced duplication and so on, and that we treat redundancy and resilience as a byproduct of how we have built it, but we have to put extra mechanisms in for that. It, it just doesn't look the same. So here's an interesting one. This is from five years ago. This is um, 3D um, uh, uh, printing. Um, and, or rather, two of these examples of 3D printing. Um, one of these is designed by humans. Two of these are um, uh, based on machine learning. And one of them is a much more optimized version than the other. The one, and you, it's not very hard to guess which is which, um, the one on the right uses significantly less material and is actually uh, stronger than the one on the left. And the one on the one in the middle is a kind of intermediate form. Now, these, uh, the one on the right can carry the same load, if not more than the one on the left. 
you can tell that the one on the left was designed by humans. It, it has a modular aspect to it. You can understand how it works. If you were to ask um, if you had uh, the appropriate background or were given a, a simple formula, you could work out how the stresses um, are distributed. You could easily engineer for a particular stress mode. The one on the right, however, you, you can't do that. It's not designed like that. To understand its design, well, it wasn't designed to be understood. That's the key thing. The problem, however, is not that it's, it, the problem is not that it's good. It's that it doesn't make sense. We, or rather, we are not always able to make sense of such constructs. And if we change things, it turns out that all those wonderful properties of modularity that we care about and separateness, we care about those because it allows us to reason about and isolate change. Life does not do it like that. And things that look like life or borrow principles from life, such as we call it machine learning, but really it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's large engine statistics. That's what you're doing. You, know, you are uh, basically running, running a, a lot of data with an optimal constraint algorithm, of various kinds. Training is simply exposure to data. You are basically trying to set the weights and trying to figure out what is something that satisfies the problem. Your goal is not to reason about the problem. That is not the goal. This means that when we come to change things, we may be surprised. And we also have to, our assumptions um, are also the ones that defeat us. So one of the things I do on um, Facebook is I, I run a, a page, Word Friday. Um, occasionally I will put up a, um, a, a definition of a word or phrase that is uh, of interest and is potentially unusual on a Friday. Um, uh, other days of the week, I just put up other stuff to do with ling linguistics and words. And um, this is one that caught my eye a couple of years back, the case principle. <clears throat> the principle that in highly entangled systems, changing anything changes everything. They are not modular. The act of adding, removing or modifying something can have significant global effects. Changing seemingly unrelated qualities of a system, undermining the assumption and principle of locality and modularity. And these are the principles by which we reason, by, by which we talk about things and that in which every single one of our paradigms, our design paradigms, uh, embodies this. The point here is, as J. Wright Forrester, um, kind of one of the pioneers of computer science and systems engineering, observed complex systems are counterintuitive. That is, they give indications that suggest corrective action, which will often be ineffective or even adverse in its results. Now, we already know this from the way that people operate. People are not modular. That we have, we, one of the biggest challenges of any software development process is accounting for the fact that um, people are both brilliant and stupid often in the, in the, in the same day. Um, that we are not rational, reasonable beings um, and that our interactions are not always subject to reason. We um, often have emergent behavior that is quite frankly astonishing and surprising and not always to our benefit. Uh, but there is this idea that we are counter to reason, that things are not as deterministic as we would like. But this is not just about people. It turns out that this is intrinsic, even at the lower level. I came across this paper 15 years ago, Chaos in Computer Performance, uh, computer performance and it was examining um, uh, uh, microprocessors and looking at the state of these and you'd think well this is very ordered and very clear because the rules are very clear turns out that that's not really the whole story our results strongly support the idea that execution of several programs consists of a low dimensional chaotic system if you think about what's currently going on you know you're currently watching something um, streamed through online you've got You've got a whole load of video processing there. You've got sound processing running. You've probably got a bunch, you know, a nice big operating system running in the background. You've got a bunch of Slack notifications that you're ignoring for at least hopefully for the duration of this talk. You've got all of these things. What is the state of that thing at the bottom? You know, there's a, it, it actually turns out that it is a chaotic system. What does a chaotic system mean? Uh, as opposed to a disordered system, a chaotic system implies that precise long-term prediction, the performance for these programs is not accessible. Our results confirm that program executions on modern microprocessor architectures form complex systems. This is kind of important. We just took humans out of the equation and we've seen that it's actually intrinsic to the very nature of highly connected systems that have responses and reactions and also have some kind of degree of concurrency um, 
and interference. And the minute you start doing that, it gets interesting. So we can take that and we can throw it out to um, ULSS. ULSS, yeah, I've got the right number of S's on that one. Um, ultra large scale um, uh, systems. And there was a study done on this um, oh, 10, 15 years ago. A um, number of people, um, uh, Douglas Schmidt, um, my co author on the Patterns books, uh, was one of the co authors, um, uh, Linda Northrup uh, from the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, and a number of others. And what they were looking at was ultra large scale systems. Not just like it's quite big, it's a few hundred thousand or a few million lines of code, but it belongs to our company. No, this is the this is the ultimate, you know, uh, in scaled systems, things that we now have distributed across the web, the web itself, but systems that rely on all of these things. And they too, even without considerations of humans, have a number of properties. They're unknowable. You have the problem that you cannot know everything uh, simultaneously at the right time. Not all information is accessible. Um, not everything is clearly time ordered. Um, they do not have a center. Um, they may be federated, they may, um, in other words, partial centers, or they may be fully decentralized. Um, this lack of center is uh, intrinsic to what makes them work, but it's also intrinsic to this idea that we do not know everything. There is no control. They are evolving. They are always running. That's another point. We have the idea that when we are sitting there as developers, we have our IDE, we have our environment as we've created it, it's all under our control. And if something that we can stop things, so it doesn't work. But we're talking about something that doesn't stop. It's, it's always in a state of evolution. Parts of it are not working. Parts of it are being upgraded. Parts of it are not quite doing what they should do, but somehow the whole thing still survives. Um, they are inconsistent. It's a polite way of, uh, or a less polite way of saying heterogeneous. In other words, they use multiple architectures, multiple technologies. They are... Um, uh, from the lowest to the highest level, individual elements are not uniform and they are constantly failing. They are ultimately unreasonable. So this is the kind of the, we are now at the point where we have fulfilled Leslie Lamport's observation. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. We've been here before, but now we're doing it at a planet wide scale. There is, and it is now normal rather than unusual. And there are some interesting consequences that are kind of slightly contradictory. So about a year ago, um, so my publisher, um, O'Reilly, um, they're based in California, or parts of them, <laughs> parts of them are based in California. Um, and this lovely uh, uh, tweet from Charlie Morris, um, there's a fire. So you, this is awkward. You go, to, you go and look at Safari, you're trying to read, um, you're trying to read your ebook. Now you are distributed elsewhere in the world. But it turns out that although we like to think of it as a perfectly distributed system, it's not. It, it, has, um, it has lumpiness. Um, you know, fire in California, can't read your book in Pennsylvania. You have consequences to highly connected systems. Um, they do have moments of locality that surprise us. We have been given the illusion that everything is, we have a global access and everything is uniform, it's truly distributed, but actually it's not like that. So again, we are surprised by this. We did not expect that. It's, it's again, it's a, it's a defeat of our assumptions. So we can actually use a, the very useful model that was introduced 40 years ago by Maya Lehman. Um, uh, S programs, P programs, E programs, a simple way of separating out the kinds of software that we are dealing with and the kinds of units that we are dealing with. So really simple idea. Um, S program, uh, program whose function is formally defined by and derivable from a specification. S is for specification. This is the stuff I can unit test, I can reason about. It's the stuff that we, we like and we focus on. Then we end up with the rather interesting case here. Acceptability of a solution is determined by the environment in which it is embedded, P programs. See, with S programs, we, already we can easily rationalize and conclude what the outcomes should be. P is for the observation that we need a, to have a procedure for figuring out what is the appropriate answer. In other words, we don't actually know the answer that we're expecting. Uh, that's kind of interesting. That also sounds a lot like machine learning. Whenever anybody tells me that their machine learning system is correct and we've got tests and so on, if they've got a little twinkle in their eye, I know that they don't know what they're doing. They are enthusiastic. They're trying to sell an idea to me. But we don't know what the acceptance criteria are for these things. Because every time you think you do, somebody will point out something that you missed. 
It's not like saying, I'm, you know, the classic lab rat of computer science, I'm going to write a sort routine, or I've got some code that um, is for an accounting system. Accounting has well-defined rules. Okay, these are internationally agreed upon rules. I can tell whether something satisfies those rules or not. It is surprisingly simple in comparison with things like the social systems that we're putting in place. Those are all P programs, but they go a little bit further. They're E programs. Programs that mechanize a human or societal activity. The program has become a part of the world it models. It is embedded in it. E is for embedded in it. In other words, the outputs of your software go into the world to change the world, which change the inputs into your software. So the software is now a part. It's not a separate aspect. And indeed, to a great, greater or lesser degree, all software has this property, but we are now entering an age where this is now the normal. That this, the very output of the systems we are working on will change the input to those systems in a fundamental way and create rather unexpected feedback cycles. It also doesn't mean these systems are intrinsically large. They are just connected in a way that surprises us because we missed an assumption. So whenever anybody tells you they understand, if anybody ever tells you we have fully tested the system, because we got 100% code coverage, two things. One, they haven't fully tested the system. If they tell you that, you need to send somebody else in because this person doesn't know what they're talking about. Two, 100% coverage. What does that mean? It's 100% statement coverage. Honestly, it's easy to achieve 100% statement coverage. If you follow certain practices, 100% statement coverage is trivial. But that's not the challenge. It's the paths through your code. Statement coverage, because people always forget to put the word statement in front of coverage, is just touching every statement once. That is trivial by comparison with understanding the possible states your system could be in. And it turns out that often we look at things in isolation because that's what we do with abstraction and so on. That's what we do. We separate things out. We regard separation as a valuable design construct. The problem is we are then sometimes surprised when we integrate it back in. So one of my favorite examples of this um, comes from a few years back. Um, and this uh, observation, uh, Michael Eisen uh, observed one day that, uh, given that we're talking about life, this seems appropriate, um, <laughs> observed one day that there's this book on Amazon, The Making of a Fly, The Genetics of Animal Design. We talked genetics a moment ago. I just want you to look at those prices. We're talking about two million US dollars. That's insane. I mean, if you look at the used price up in the top right hand corner, that's about 35 US dollars. I think I'll take it used rather than buy it new. But what you'll also notice is that there are only two vendors of this book new, Prof Math and Bordy Book, and they are both around the two million mark. What's going on here? So Michael Eisen observed this over uh, a number of days and discovered that there is a ratio a constant ratio between these two. And what we learn is that Profnath has the book. And they also have a piece of software. Their, their algorithm is that their goal is to undercut the next price in the market. They have the book, but they want to be the cheapest in the market. So they are pitching in at 99.83%. They are a slightly reduced price. Bordy book does not have the book. But what they're going to do is they have a markup model. What they're going to do is they're going to offer you the book 27% more expensive than the price that it's going to cost them to buy. So you will pay them and they will go and buy the original book and make a 20 and then sell it on to you at a 27% profit. And they've got an algorithm that does exactly this. And these two algorithms are competing with one another. And they managed to escalate the price to um, uh, over 20 million US dollars. This is insane. Now, Amazon now has checks and balances to prevent this. So you might say, oh, this is a solved problem. No, it isn't. Um, uh, uh, in Britain, we've been running a rather large scale social experiment of what happens when um, you let populist politics uh, detect, um, uh, you know, uh, influence um, uh, things that uh, populist politics is not very good at, such as finance, trade deals, um, and uh, social structures. Um, and so we've been running this experiment for a few years now. It's not going particularly well, especially during a pandemic. Um, but even under these circumstances, the flash crash of October 2016 was unusual. Um, what we saw was a huge devaluation over a matter of minutes uh, of the pound against the US dollar. I and mean, that's a really sharp fall. That's too sharp. Humans can't trade that fast. 
This is exactly the same problem. When I've got two algorithms that are competing with one another, they live in a closed universe of the assumptions of the people that built them. The people that built them think that they are being reasonable. They're saying, oh, there will be somebody else and they will use the strategy, except that what if they don't? What if you've got something that is not a somebody, but a something? And if it does it at speed, and you have not tested all the possibilities because all you did was think about reasonable possibilities. Um, you've not actually looked at what happens when the system starts feeding back off itself. And this is the case. This is normal for these systems. So Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy I made this lovely observation. Uh, there is a theory which states that if any, anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There's another theory which states this has already happened. So what we can learn from real architecture is a few things here. Always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. Yes, you need to unit test. I spent a whole part of my professional life is convincing people to unit test. This is our starting point, but it's not our end point. When you are designing something, how is it going to be used? In what context does this get used? What does that context give to meaning? Many people are after the right way, or they like simple guidelines and simple principles. I'm a little bit suspicious of these because they do not equip us with the intelligence um, that uh, is needed to look inwards and then look outwards. I think these, these are guidelines, these are patterns, they're not principles uh, that are useful in context. They are our starting point, that's why I advocate them, but they are not our end point. And we corrupt our own terminology as well. Um, we got this terminology that's been going doing the rounds for the last few years, full stack developer. And here we go. Uh, this is me and having a check on uh, uh, LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, full stack developer in the United Kingdom. You can have passionate full stack web developers. So passion is important. But let's understand when people talk about full stack, they've got a really small part of the world. That's it. Front end and back end development based on typically third party or open source software. It's a tiny, tiny little part of the stack. My background originally is this bit. Um, my background is infrastructure, middleware, systems programming, all of these stuff. If somebody tells you they're a full stack developer, ask them about their device driver development experience or you know, what they use for middleware uh, development. And uh, when they developed their own database, what did they use? Some people will be able to give you a good answer, but most people will realize that their full stack is tiny. It's this little sliver in the middle. But even that is a downward look. It's a very introspective look. We have the bigger picture. You've got to look at the outside. That's the bigger context. So the full stack includes the world and the people around the software, which is important when it comes to the next aspect of reason. AI, machine learning. AI is characterized by output that isn't strictly dependent on the input or on the algorithm. The output of an AI system depends critically on the training process in which the program learns how to perform its task. It depends on other architectural characteristics as well, but it is highly brittle with respect to its data. And the data actually, if you like, is the parameters to the algorithm. Now, we don't understand, we understand a little bit about the, so it's always a misnomer when people talk about algorithms, unless they're also prepared to include the training data. In other words, we regard this as uh, self-adapting code. The training data actually is part of um, the programming and the metaprogramming. And you will not find anybody who is a data scientist who understands their data. Oh, they have sense of bulk properties, but when you're dealing with millions of items, that's not humans. Humans don't deal with millions of items. So the best we get is bulk awareness, which is, which is a problem because we often realize that we aren't actually programming without understanding what we're doing. We get some great results, but it is intrinsic. It's intrinsic to the nature of the software that it is not fully understood. It is unknowable. And it is filled with all kinds of odd cases and assumptions that do not make sense. And it's fundamentally different to our traditional view. Now, if you've gone through computer science with a traditional data structures and algorithms training, guess what? AI is coming for you. The case for learned index structures. What a brilliant idea. Optimize based on actual usage, highly adaptive. We like these adaptive things. We talk about adaptive runtimes and so on. What about data structures that actually do this and are based on machine learning? Our initial results show, and here you go, the, you, here we see the classic AI optimism. Our initial results show that by using neural nets, we are able to outperform cache optimized B trees by up to 70% in speed while saving an order of magnitude in memory over several real world data sets. This is good. This is objective. This is really cool. 
This is the bit that's more troubling. More importantly, though, we believe the idea of replacing core components of a data management system through learned models has far reaching implications for future systems designs. And this work just provides a glimpse of what might be possible. Oh, yes, I think we know what's possible because we've seen it outside the realm of data structures and algorithms. It does provide huge opportunities. But if you pretend that you understand everything that's going on and you are going to try apply traditional techniques to that part, you are in for a big surprise because this is what we're really doing. It's kind of a retrospective coherence. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of pattern matching. It's kind of accidentally recognizing faces um, in toast. Machine learning is a fancy way of saying finding patterns in data. Of course, as Lydia Nicholas explains, all this data has to be collected, have been collected in the past. And that since society changes, you can end up with patterns that reflect the past. So intrinsically, you are based on the narrowness of the data collection and the biases in the data set and the data set col uh, collectors. Um, unless you are aware of all of these, you're gonna be surprised by the results. The results don't prepare you for the future. What you're doing is preparing yourself for a particular view of the past and you may optimize that and you can get some really great results which is why some things that work in a more timeless fashion that are not to do with society and are to do with uh, say uh, visual recognition in a very simple sense um, uh, can be surprisingly effective but they're still closed universe concepts if those patterns are used to make decisions that affect people's lives you end up with unacceptable discrimination this is your machine, you know, it's a classic XKCD system. This is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Oh, just stir the pile and, until they start looking right. This, what we're dealing with here is the challenge of the limits of knowability and, a, and how we need to understand context with respect to reasoning or the limits of our reasoning. So Adrian Collier had this observation when he was talking um, about measuring fairness and he the timing of me reading this was quite interesting because I, I got interested in a lot of the stuff that happened in the earlier part of the last century in mathematics um, and there's this idea that at the beginning of the last century that we had this vision that we were going to solve everything in maths it was going to be cons complete and consistent and so on and so uh, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North White had published Principia Mathematica with the goal of providing a solid foundation for all mathematics um, 1931, Gödel's incompleteness theorems shattered the dream, showing for any consistent axiomatic system, there will always be theorems that cannot be proven within the system. So this is a really important observation. One premise of many models of fairness in machine learning is that you can measure or prove fairness of the machine learning model from within the system, i.e. from the properties of the model itself and perhaps the data it is trained on. And the point here is that we know that's not true. We've known for nearly 100 years that you can't do that. Um, that's not actually something you do. You can only do that by taking it from the outside. So um, uh, an interesting talk uh, by uh, Arvind Naranyan uh, from MIT. Um, he talks about specifically the application of AI for predicting social outcomes. Hunger for personal data, massive transfer of power for domain experts and workers to unaccountable tech companies, lack of explainability, we also know that explainable AI is not actually about explainable AI, it's about interpreting. If it were explainable, then we'd be able to recover the models and replace the AI system with the models. This is an important idea or an important distinction. Um, distraction, it distracts from interventions and it gives us a veneer of accuracy. We trust it because the machine said so. So we have a number of issues that we have to deal with. Um, and even that's not the limits of reason. Um, you know, we go back to our elegant view of the world and this idea, you know, maybe I can just write everything in Lisp or my favorite language of choice. And we are, we are left with this rather nice uh, uh, XKCD. Last night I drifted off while reading a Lisp book. Suddenly I was bathed in a suffusion blue. At once, just like this said, I felt great enlightenment. I saw the naked structure of Lisp code uh, uh, before me. Um, there's a lot of references to 2001 um, Space Odyssey and, uh, uh, and uh, Lisp in here. And truly, this was the language from which the gods wrought the universe. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, ostensibly, yes, but honestly, we hacked most of it together with Perl. And we lost the documentation on quantum mechanics. You'll have to decode the ring X's yourself. So I'm not going to dive into quantum mechanics, um, but there is this observation that we there is a boundary on knowability and what we can reason about system. We are entering the era of uh, quantum mechanics 
um, quantum computing. And what is one of the most interesting things from an observer's point of view is that when a company says, we've achieved quantum supremacy, or we've got a quantum computer that has this kind of performance and has this many qubits, most of the rest of the industry doesn't go, oh, okay, that's the one to beat. They go, are you sure? I don't think you do, but nobody can really prove it the same way. Um, the problem here is that it's, it's, it's difficult. It's really hard stuff. It's very unlike what we are used to. So um, as the observation goes, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty, and that's what we're getting. Uh, so in closing, we need to remind ourselves um, that in many cases we are, uh, as Edward uh, Murrow, um, uh, a, a journalist in the US uh, middle of the last century, the newest computer can merely compound at speed the oldest problems in the relations between human beings. And in the end, the communicator will be confronted with the old problem of what to say and how to say it. Sometimes we are part of the challenge, but sometimes it's just the way of the world. Thank you very much. I believe we might have a little bit of time for questions. I know we don't have a lot of time, but uh, we might be able to squeeze a couple of questions in there. Uh, and thank you, Kevin. Uh, yes, we have uh, at least one. And I have one myself. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, all right. So uh, first one, I think you covered uh, some of it. Uh, I'll read it uh, at later on. Basically, it's explainable AI seems to get traction, and there seem to be methods that explain parts of the ML algorithm for re re uh, regulatory reasons, which yeah. you already covered. The question is, is the world going towards less unreasonable? I No, I think we're going to more towards more unreasonable. Um, the point is that I'm not... I'm not saying that the research that uh, people are doing and the work that's being done in explainable AI is not relevant, but it is, it is overstated. Because if I could fully explain what the AI system was doing, then I wouldn't need the AI system. If I can actually describe the rules by which it is um, arriving at its conclusions, then I do not need that system. I need the rules. So at best, these are approximations, at best. Yeah? So we are fooling ourselves if we think that explainable AI, AI is actually explaining it. The one thing it's not doing is explaining it. It's looking at a bunch of matrices and it's going, I have no idea what these numbers are. You know what? I'll, I'll do model test. Well, there's a number of different ones. There's model testing is one approach. But what we're doing is we're achieving um, post hoc reasoning. We're reasoning after the fact. What might explain this? We're throwing theories at a system and the ones that kind of fit, we sort of say, well, that seems to be a good explanation. Um, but in truth, um, we, need to, we need to downgrade um, uh, downgrade what we are, uh, the, the claims that we are making. If somebody does come up with an explainable AI system, I would, uh, in the truest sense of the word explainable, then, you know, more power to them, but that's not what's happening. Um, there is a fundamental limit to the point that if you can explain it perfectly, then what you have just done is recreated what it is doing. So why are we doing that rather than using the explanation? Because the explanation will therefore be deterministic and rule-based. So that's not what's going on. It's not that these are without value, but we need to treat them with a certain degree of caution. They might be simply offering us a misunderstanding. And in this sense, they are very like life and people. When you ask somebody why they're doing something, they don't really give you the reason. They kind of make up a reason. We normally make up reasons about why we do things. We don't even know we're doing it. Um, but we are normally wrong to at least a small degree and sometimes wrong to a huge degree. So uh, we need to be as suspicious of explainable AI as we are um, of other people when they uh, make claims in the court of law. Okay, so it's on that level. Well, I, th that's very well put. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this. Uh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, we built machines to our likeness. So this yeah, is yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, in that sense, it is unsurprising. But you know, we but we need to have that. We need to take a step back and understand. Oh, you know. This is really cool, but let's understand the boundary of what we can say about it. I think that's, uh, we need to not become marketing and salespeople, okay? Because that, we need to be, need to be a little bit, we need to be more scientific about it, be skeptical of what we've created. What we've created is great, it's magnificent, it's brilliant. Um, but we're also skeptical because it's also <laughs> very naive um, in, in places. We, we need to hold this kind of balance. Very, very much agree. And uh, do you feel that we've, we've gotten to an age, well, let's say, we're living through the religion of the machine? Mm. Because you, you, you said one thing earlier, you know, the, the we, we trust the algorithm because the algorithm says so. And yes. I, I 
for me at least, I, I get the feeling that we're, we're using our rational faculties less and less, and we just believe what's being thrown at us because, yeah, it's the algorithm, it cannot be mistaken. I think there is a, I think there's a reason for that. I, it's not so much to do with we are consciously using less. I think it's a side effect of the idea that we, um, there is, with software, it's depersonalized. There's no human involved when we're interacting with it. We tend to, uh, if, if software proves sufficiently reliable, it doesn't have to be 100% reliable. If it proves sufficiently reliable and sufficiently useful, then we value it, we start trusting it. This goes down to the deep human concept of trust. What's also nice is that we know that the software doesn't carry emotional baggage. Now, if somebody I am suspicious of or I don't trust tells me something, I might be a little cautious about accepting it, okay? I might find reasons not to accept it. And I've, I've used this point when I'm dealing with code reviews and things as the point that sometimes your colleague may say something, but if your static analyzer, your linter says something, people pay attention to the linter because it doesn't have a personal emotional stake. So, and it's normally kind of right. And it gives us enough that we trust it and we regard it as more objective. So our, our trust in machines is partly because we don't see a person there, but also sometimes if they work sufficiently well, we are more likely to trust them. And trust is basically not always, trust is a, a relationship where we don't have to always dig into the relationship. When you trust someone and you trust a person and they say something or do something, you go, oh, okay. Um, when you don't trust something, you are more cautious and more skeptical and so on. And you, you have your guard up. With machines, we have no human, um, and we have something that offers a consistent or sufficiently good thing. So it kind of tricks our biology into going like, yeah, this, this is trustworthy. And honestly, when it comes to things like addition, if you add up numbers a million times, I'm going to trust a computer more than I trust a human because humans just aren't very good at doing things a million times. So we've got really good reasons to trust them. But the problem is that shouldn't be unconditional and 100%. So we kind of fall for our own trick, if you like. That's the problem here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I won't start the uh, yeah, cult of the Mac. Well, there, there's a website for this. <laughs> but, yeah, I won't start a new one then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's already been done. <laughs> yeah, check. Uh, thank you so much, Kevlin. Th thanks so much. You, you, uh, I, I really enjoyed your talk. And uh, yeah, uh, so I'm sad. Uh, yeah, it has come to an end. <laughs> yeah, time, but, time uh, for a break. Time for a break. Looking forward to your next uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Evelyn.